Thanks again for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, can't say that the venue is too shabby either. Um, but so here's an interesting thing. So we're here tending to be talking about what for many people is an incredibly controversial topic, right? Low carb. Well, within this controversial topic, I get to talk about the controversial topic. Yes. OK. So, but I'm not here to pronounce that, oh, hey, I I'm here to say this is the answer, OK? Um, or that is the answer, or that anybody has the answer. What I'm actually here today to talk about is the questions that we have. Because a lot of people would consider low carb, high fat, maybe even a fringe topic. And what I do is not fringy. What I practice is science. I have a science-based practice. And when you have a science-based practice, you have to not only understand what's known, you also have to be constantly asking questions, understanding those questions about what isn't yet known, and, so, and looking for answers for those questions. And so I'm going to kind of try to cover that in a very brief bit here. But really quick first, kind of a quick background on me and how I got here talking about this today. So I actually started out as an exercise physiologist. Didn't want to go to med school from age five. Um, actually did it um, once I got accepted to get my PhD. Um, I always joke around that I was the only person who disappointed their parents when I said I was going to med school. Because my parents were both PhDs and that was supposed to be my path and then I changed my mind halfway. But anyway, um, then I became an internist and I practiced primary care for a while, actually almost 10 years. Um, but always obviously, based on my background as an exercise physiologist, had this interest in um, weight loss. So when Indiana University Health wanted to open a weight loss program, they came to me and I was glad to do it. And people always say, how did you come upon low carb for your practice? And I said, because when they asked me to do this, I wanted to do a good job. And I went to the science, and that's what was working, right? That's what we had evidence really helped. So my uh, practice from day one has been only low carb based. That's what I do. I run a low carb practice. And yes, my uh, practice is called uh, medically supervised weight loss. But one of my goals this year is to convince um, IU that we want to change the name. Because weight loss is secondary to me. I run a metabolic health practice, and that's really important to me. Um, and within this, when I realized some of these changes that we were seeing in cholesterol on our patients, I said, OK, I need to understand this even more. And so I'd already had my obesity certification, but I went back and got board certified as a clinical lipidologist, too, because I wanted to really understand this. I wanted to be able to understand the questions. OK, so I have our goals here. And I put this here more than anything for me, because I will tell you right now that I could talk about this topic, topic for three hours, maybe six. So I got to keep myself on track. And I'm going to try my best to keep us out of the weeds on a lot of this stuff. But number one, I want to review some of the known and unknown about LDL on a low carb diet. And we're going to review a little bit on LDL-C, LDL-P, and small dense LDL, just a little bit of the physiology. What does the current literature tell us? What are some of the possible mechanisms for rise in LDL? Um, understand the questions that remain. And again, I think that's the most important part. And then I want to tell you about a research project that we have going on in my clinic right now to try to get to the bottom of some of those questions. All right. So what do we know about LDL on a low-carb, high-fat diet? Well, we know that saturated fats cause a rise in LDL-C and LDL-P in some people. And we also know that there are many studies that show us that low-carb, high-fat will decrease small, dense LDL. Okay, So those are both pretty well established. What do we not know? Well, actually, this list is pretty long. Um, what is the exact percentage of patients who have a rise in their LDL? I mean, those of us who do this, who practice this clinically, absolutely understand that most people do not have any problem with their LDL, whether you're talking about LDLC or LDLP. They do a low-carb, high-fat diet, and their LDL doesn't change. Or, to surprise to many in the mainstream, eating a lot of fat makes your LDL better. But we all know also that there's a subset of patients that that's not true on. How many exactly? And not only that, but 
how many in different demographics? What if you're insulin resistant? What's the percentage there? What if you're insulin sensitive? And can we identify patients who are going to have a rise ahead of time? Is that possible? How much does LDLC rise if we correlate it with LDLP? And does rapid weight loss temporarily increase LDL in some patients? And we'll talk about that a little bit. And how much improvement in small, dense LDL? And again, the demographic difference in this area as well over time. And how about the amount of carb restriction? And then I'm going to cover a little bit about residence time of LDL particles. But ultimately, here is the big question. Does a rise in LDLC or LDLP represent increased risk in that percentage of patients where we see this? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows that for sure. OK, so real quick, LDLC. What does that mean? This is the one we're used to looking at, right? This is what everybody always orders. I don't. I don't order standard lipid panels in any of my patients anymore. I order NMRs because I think that LDLC is not what we want to be looking at. I don't think it tells us enough information. What does it exactly mean? It just tells us how much cholesterol is in our particles. Just the cholesterol. It doesn't tell us anything about the particle itself. So really quick, again, without getting too much in the, in the weeds here, and this goes back to our insulin-resistant patient, okay? Those with our high triglycerides. Patients who have insulin resistance and have these high triglyceride levels, they are secreting these big triglyceride-rich VLDL particles, okay? And these are problematic all by themselves because these big particles here increase viscosity, they cause endothelial dysfunction, increase in uh, hypercoagulable uh, state. So all by themselves, they're problems. But then they become even bigger problems. Because what happens is, number one, sometimes we get, oh, I don't have a pointer here. We get these broken down, these big VLDL particles. The triglycerides get pulled out from them, and we get these very cholesterol-rich remnants, OK, which are probably problematic. Then we get this exchange, cholesterol ester transfer protein right here, okay, is constantly exchanging the core of these particles with other LDL and HDL particles. And when that happens, and then hepatic lipase comes along, what happens is we form these small LDL particles. Okay, so this is why when someone does a well-formulated, low-carb, high-fat diet, we get improvements in the triglycerides. But then what that leads to, and is probably incredibly important here, is that that leads to less of these small LDL particles. So then we get to this LDLP number, which is what I'm much more interested in. Okay? And as we can see from because of that physiology that we just saw on the last slide, what we can have is two very different situations with the exact same LDLC number. So you're carrying around the same cargo. Your LDLC number is the same, but the number of particles that that LDLC is being carried in is very different. So if we have those small, dense particles, okay, and you're carrying around a LDLC of let's just throw it out and say 70, well, if they're all small, it's going to take a lot more of those particles to carry that cargo, that 70. Whereas if we have the larger ones, again, this is what we tend to see in a low-carb, high-fat diet, it's going to take a lot fewer of those. Okay? So our particle number is going to be important. And we miss this totally if we just look at a standard lipid panel. All right, so then we've got the small dense. And you guys all heard it, pattern A, pattern B. Again, pattern A, big. Pattern B is that small dense, right? The small dense, more problematic lipoprotein particles. OK, so let's go over some of the research, OK? So this study, first of all, I, I am not going to cover all the research, first of all, that we have here. I mean, there's just tons. Um, and the ones that I'm covering are only ones where they actually looked at NMR data, OK? So they didn't just look at the uh, LDLC. So here we go. In 2003, healthy, normal, lipidemic um, women on a very low carb versus low fat diet for six weeks. And what I have on each of these slides bolded is the demographic, OK? And I think that's important because what we can see is that we've covered a lot of demographics on this topic, OK? And we'll find here 
that the results are pretty consistent, despite the difference in demographics. So we have an increase in LDLC compared to low fat for the low carb group. No change in relative percentage of concentration of LDL subclass versus low fat. Um, three of the 10 who wound up with the more problematic pattern B had an increase in their LDL size. Great. Um, and this was eucaloric. All right, so here we go. Look at the de demographic. Different. Now from normal women, we went to overweight men. Low carb, very low carb again, versus low fat for six weeks. LDLC not significantly changed in the low carb group here. Increase in the large, decrease in the, in the small. Fantastic, right? All looks good. 75% of pattern B switched to pattern A. No change in oxidized LDL. Urine ketones and food dyers were used to make sure that these people were following. One pattern A switched to pattern B. Oops. Okay, so what do we say? Sucks to be you, right? I, I, mean, I mean, but wait a minute. We can't say that. We can't say that, right? Because I'm a doctor running a clinical practice. And just because our averages are good doesn't mean I can enjoy, uh, ignore this guy, right? I care about him too. And what happens to him matters. And I will tell you that I see this. I see this all the time. I see this in patients who are following a ketogenic diet, who are clearly listening to me. Their ketones are high. They're having dramatic improvements in their A1C, yet their triglycerides are up. Their small dents rise significantly. Their LDLP is way high. It's not the norm. It's definitely not the norm, but it happens. All right, so next one. Again, look at the demographics. Severely obese patients, 86% with diabetes or metabolic syndrome, very low carb versus low fat for six months. LDLP decreased the same in both groups. Huh, the same, a decrease. Um, only the amount of weight actually correlated significantly with the decrease in LDLP. Both diets increased large LDL, decreased small LDL. They both worked in this case. Um, diet recall was the method used. Um, big dropout rate big dropout rate in the study. Um, and some of these patients were on lipid lowering medication and of course we all know that that's, that matters. Okay, so here we go, another different demographic. Obese patients treated with statins who had pre-existing coronary artery disease. This is a really interesting study. So basically they just told these guys, all right, eat a bunch of meat, right? I mean, I want you to eat a half a pound of beef at every meal. I mean, this was kind of the dietary instruction that these guys were given. And um, they were checking ketones, but the interesting thing is they were checking ketones to try to make sure people weren't in ketosis. And they were confounded by why some of these people were actually in ketosis, given this instruction, eat only meat and cheese. So anyway, just, just very interesting, very interesting. But um, 10 out of the 23 patients had metabolic syndrome at baseline, and of those, 8 out of 10 reduced or resolved. One non-metabolic syndrome patient developed it. Aha. It happens, it happens, even on meat and cheese. Um, 2009, abdominal obesity, at least one other metabolic syndrome risk factor, very low carb versus low fat for 52 weeks, trend up in ApoB in the low carb group, but it was not statistically significant. Beta hydroxybutyrate was higher in the low carb group, but quite frankly, it was still low if you look at the numbers. Um, isocaloric food diary was used. Um, LDL, uh, or here we go again, 2005 overweight hyperlipidemic versus very low carb, low carb versus low fat, six months. No difference in LDLP. Both went down. They both went down. Again, really great. Wonderful. Large LDL increases in 54% in the low carb group, unchanged in the low fat group, decreased small dents. Okay. So, all right, so we know that this happens, right, in some people. We know we just looked here. We can see that even in these different demographic groups that I just pointed out, the trend is the same. When we look at the groups, things are better. They're just better, okay? But individually, that's not always the case. So why? Why do some people have a rise in LDLP or LDLC? 
And well, there's a lot of different reasons that this may occur, but one I think that is really interesting here, because I, I point this out specifically because I'll tell you what I see in a specific subgroup. I see people who are insulin resistant, and they go on a, like, a low carb, high fat diet, everything gets better. Everything gets better across the board. Oh my gosh, you know, their LDL is better, their diabetes has been resolved, their triglycerides are way down, they're better. And a year later, they've maintained their weight loss, all that stuff looks good, except for all of a sudden their LDL is up. It wasn't before, initially, it's later. It's kind of like almost like an insulin sensitive problem that they've developed. And I think that there may be a mechanism as to why that occurs. Because if we see here, and we talk about insulin and ApoB, what we see here is insulin is supposed to come in, bind to the receptor, and it activates insulin uh, receptor substrate, which, acts, uh, which activates um, phosphatidylinestatol, I'm going to probably botch this, phosphatidylinestatol-3 kinase, which then activates AKT, which is a huge branch point here, a really important one, because AKT does two things. It blocks FOX01. And why is that significant here? FOX01 will then shut down gluconeogenesis. The blockade of that will turn off gluconeogenesis. And it will also down-regulate something called MTP, microsomal transfer protein, which is what lipidates VLDLs. So this action of insulin coming in, if this all functions properly, will actually decrease ApoB. That would be good. But what if we're really low now on our insulin? Because now we're not insulin resistant anymore. We're insulin sensitive. We're following a low carb diet properly. We're doing a great job with it. Now our insulin levels are really low. Could we have just introduced a problem in some people with this mechanism? It's possible. It's possible. Now again, and I'm going to try to not get here too uh, into the woods, but mTOR also plays a role in here, OK? And big thing to understand, really basics, insulin, growth factor. mTOR, growth factor. They can be problematic. And what we see with insulin resistance is that the block, the block in FOX01 does not occur. However, mTOR still gets activated. So we still have our growth going, but this time we're blocking the FOX01 which essentially, if we can get that blockade, would shut down the ApoB. So we can kind of see here how this could run into a problem. OK, so then the other thing too, and I just want to, again, I'm not going to get too much into this, but I want to point out one thing. And that is that when carbs are low, glucose is low, OK, we are needing to oxidize fat for energy, right? I mean, we all accept that, that we understand that. And when fat gets oxidized, we make acetyl-CoA. And one thing I want to uh, point out is acetyl-CoA is the beginning of ketone bodies, but it's also the beginning in making cholesterol. So it can go both ways. It can go both ways. And there's many reasons why it would do one over the other. But the other thing is there's going to be individual variants in this, very much so. OK, so LDL residence time. And I think this is really important, OK? So this could be a big protective mechanism, even in these people who have higher LDLPs. Because maybe their LDLP is high, but we've got this constant circulation. So any LDLP particle is not in the circulation for long. Small, dense LDL lasts for about five days. Large, two days. That's a big difference. So even in these people who have a rise in LDLP, is it possibly not problematic because they're just constantly circulating this? That's possible. There's more oxidative damage in these aged, if you will, small, dense LDL particles. OK, so here's an inter interesting thing. I mean, a lot of people who will criticize low carb, high fat will point um, to the Scott G uh, Grundy uh, trials from a while ago that showed that saturated fat will decrease our LDL uh, receptors. 
And if you go back and look at that, the problem is that, yes, they were on a high saturated fat diet, but they were also on a high carb diet. It was a high both. So I think it's very difficult to then move that and say, we're comparing apples to apples here when we're talking about a low carbohydrate diet. Uh, very difficult. And one of the big reasons may actually be PCSK9s. Because anyone heard of the PCSK9 inhibitors? Yeah, they're the big things, right? Okay, so I'm kind of horrified by these medications because my big fear is if they become in widespread use that we're going to all of a sudden have a society where everybody has an LDL cholesterol of 20, and Lord knows in 10 years what's going to happen as a consequence of that. Makes me really nervous. But the fact of the matter is the deal with PCSK9 is if you can inhibit PCSK9, Easy way to think of it. Inhibit PCSK9, more LDL receptors stay up. Okay? We can get that circulation. We can speed up the circulation because we're able to take in more of the LDL particles. And insulin increases PCSK9. So in essence, if we can decrease insulin, we're actually upregulating those receptors. Why those studies then, who are high carb and high saturated fat may not be applicable at all in a carb restricted, a restrictive state, a restricted state, excuse me, I could say that. So anyway, so that, that really matters. So residence time, I think, is going to be a big part of the answer to our many questions here. Okay, and then just really quick, again, I don't want to get into this too much, but I, like I said before earlier, I don't order standard lipid panels. I, especially because I run a weight loss clinic, and so most of my patients, if not all of them really, are insulin resistant. And a regular lipid panel is so unhelpful in an insulin resistant person. I get NMRs on everybody. And it's interesting in the cholesterol world right now, we kind of have developed two camps, right? A camp that says LDLP is really important, and that's the big thing we need to be following. A camp that says small dense is really important. And I think there's evidence for both. But I can kind of firmly plant one foot on each side of this because I can say what I do tends to improve both. Okay? So studies for a while have suggested that LDLP was the most important thing and that small dense really doesn't um, matter that much if you're looking at total particle numbers. But I think newer studies are bringing this into question. So I think, again, what we're going to find at the end of the day is that both play a role. Okay, so what about rapid weight loss and its impact? So Steve Finney did a study of this a while ago and does mobilization of fat because our biggest cholesterol stores, right, where are they? Our biggest cholesterol stores are in our fat. So if I've got someone who's lost 30 pounds in two months and their cholesterol goes up, is that maybe part of the answer? Is that they've just mobilized all this stuff? And I think we don't have big data set on this yet. But anecdotally in my clinic, I think I'm going to say for a lot of people the answer to this is yes. That if we wait until they get weight stabilized, that we see that LDL come down. So are these people who have a rise in LDL over-absorbing cholesterol in their diet? No. No. I mean, we only absorb 50% of the cholesterol in our gut. And of that 50%, 85% of it is endogenous, okay, is not what we're eating. So you just have to be eating such massive amounts of this stuff to really have absorption be a problem here. Okay, so case closed, right? I mean, what did I just present you? I presented you all these things. It sounds great. Case is closed. LDLP doesn't matter because everything else is better, right? Not so fast. Because I think we've been down this road before, right? And I think we all, as a community, have highly criticized this road, justifiably. Let's go back and, and draw a parallel. Low fat. How could it be wrong? Right? Come on. You cut the fat out of your diet. You're going to cut the fat out of you. It's going to be perfect. We're all going to be healthy and happy because of it. The road of unintended consequences. We have to be asking, is there any chance we do the same thing? I don't know. I don't know the answer. And for most people, I would say absolutely not, because we just saw everything gets better. Everything gets better. But what about those poor guys? What about those one whose 
LDLP went up, whose small dents even went up, and stayed up. Is there un any unintended co intended consequence there? We have to be asking these questions. We have to, because the fact of the matter is nobody knows the answer. All right, so I want to know the answer. <laughs> I want to know the answer. So we've got a current study going on that I don't, by any stretch of the imagination, claim is going to solve every question. But it's going to go away to helping us understand this better. OK, so what is our, our study? 500 patients um, with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes are enrolled. We just finally closed enrollment. Yes. OK, so um, and defined by a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 or higher who meets the criteria for metabolic syndrome. So these are our insulin resistant patients. OK, so we got to, of course, understand we're just following that one demographic here. OK, so 400 of these patients are treatment patients, all treated with a ketogenic diet. So these people are eating a lot of saturated fat, OK, a lot of saturated fat. Blood ketones are obtained um, so that we can make sure that they're actually doing what they're saying they're doing. 200 of these patients are treated live in our clinic. Okay, we see them initially on a weekly basis, then they go to every other week, then some of our patients are already on just monthly visits and they taper off after that. And it's over two years. So yay, this is gonna be some longer term data. 200 of these patients are gonna be treated with a ketogenic diet, but they're all being treated virtually, online. They get all their education, all their medical care being done via computer. Now we have 100 control patients treated with a good old ADA. Who do you think is going to do better? Okay. So can I tell you a funny story on this? I'll tell you a funny story on this. So we had a patient call the clinic the other day who was in our control group just throwing a fit at the staff. Well, I've got a bunch of uh, my friends who are in the treatment group, and they're all getting better. They're off their medicine. <laughs> to be a control patient. This is a totally raw deal here. OK, so anyway, I mean, we explained all this to every patient. But anyway, he, once the reality hit in and he could see, it was pretty interesting. OK, so um, all right, so our primary outcomes, body weight, metabolic syndrome criteria, type 2 diabetes status, OK? But we're also looking at some secondary outcomes, again, that relate to this LDL question. So we're looking at carotid intima media thicknesses measured by ultrasound. Um, over two years. We're getting baseline one year and two year data on these people, okay? And we'll be able to see, obviously, we're getting NMR data on these regular, uh, on a regular basis. So in these people whose LDLP goes up, is it associated with progression of disease? And the other question is, you know, how is it, uh, how is the disease progressing in association with the people who are treated with the ADA plan? So I think this is going to be a really important and interesting um, information. We're also getting uh, DEXA's full body so we can get body fat percentage. And we've got a lot of bank samples, too, so that we can kind of decide that there are other parameters we want to look at in the future. And believe me, there will be plenty, I'm sure, that we're going to come up with so we can get some questions answered. Um, so the ultimate questions here, does the rise in LDLP in a minority Remember, and it's a minority of patients, okay? I think a lot of people in the mainstream don't appreciate that. But the minority of patients still count. On a low-carb, high-fat diet represent an increased risk of vascular disease. And does LDLP resident time go down, thereby making a high particle number less relevant? Um, can we predict who these people are who are going to have this rise in LDLP? Do all patients eventually have a decrease in small dents who follow a low-carb, high-fat diet. Will they get there at some point? How long after dietary changes should we be checking lipids? Or should we wait for weight stability so we don't freak anybody out, right? Because some of those people may have that rise from weight loss itself. And is insulin, I mean, here's a crazy question, potentially a double-edged sword for some? It's possible. All right, so thank you again. Like I said, I think the big question is, if we want to be science-based, science-driven, we have to constantly be asking the questions. And sometimes that means acknowledging the things we don't 100% know. Thank you very much.